Hello, everybody. My name is John Mark Johnson, Jr. I am the host of Relationship and Truth, and this is not going to be a feature link video per se. However, I haven't done anything very long on this channel for quite some time now, and my main problem is that most of the stuff that I do do on this channel is fairly long, and I've been at home uh, recently instead of out and about working like I normally do. And um, the, the problem is that my apartments, if I turn off the air conditioning, it heats up pretty quickly and it gets really uncomfortable. And a lot of my videos for my Relationship and Truth channel get pretty long because I go up, take a topic and I just dive into it. It's not uncommon for the, the videos to last one and a half to two and a half, sometimes even three hours. Um, I don't know if I've actually had one quite three hours, but at least eh, two and a half, certainly. Uh, that's not uh, terribly uncommon for my channel, and so, and I like being able to do everything all at once and just kind of get it done and over with. And so when I'm home, I don't typically do a whole lot of relationship and truth uh, video cha uh, channel videos just because I don't like being hot and sweaty and it gets to be really, really, really super uncomfortable, so I just kind of put them on the back burner. Uh, but it does kind of feel like I've been neglecting the channel, so I'm not going to do a feature link video per se, but I did want to take the time to talk about the uh, the background of one of the projects that I'm working on. And this one is actually proving to be fairly extensive, so you guys will probably see quite a bit more material from it. I'm not sure exactly how or what format yet, uh, but suffice it to say that there is enough for a mini-series, not a huge mini-series, but a mini-series of sorts if I wanted to. Um, but I'm going to give a little bit of background here, uh, hopefully to provide a little bit of context as to why this is coming up. Uh, this uh, project was kind of instigated, not necessarily intentionally, but instigated uh, by someone in my church who, uh, during a teaching service, had the opportunity to speak uh, regarding, our, um, uh, regarding the uh, Belgian Confession of Faith. And that's one of the three forms of unity that my church subscribes to. We are a... Uh, you are a CNA Church, uh, United uh, Reformed Church of North America. And uh, one of the creeds and confessions that we hold to includes the Belgic Confession, and the Belgic Confession is very specific about saying these books that the, the Catholics have in their Bibles, we don't have in ours, basically. That's a very summarized form of way of saying it, but... That's basically what it says. And, and so it's talking about what we as Protestants very commonly call the Apocrypha. And uh, this uh, talk that this person gave, while I'm sure very sincere and to a certain extent researched, um, was severely lacking in a great number of areas. And I'm not necessarily trying to pick on this particular person because I know this person. He is a friend of mine. And like I said, I, I believe he went into this very sincerely. Uh, but the problem that I have is that the is that the reasons he gave for why Protestants reject what are called the Apocrypha commonly turned out not to be very good. And like I said, this isn't something that I blame him for because to a large extent he was just repeating arguments that he had heard from other people and studied from other people and reading their sources and their material and so on and so forth. And he basically kind of wind up regurgitating the, the party line, if you will. And unfortunately, we as Protestants can do that quite a bit. And lots of groups do it, not just Protestants, but Protestants do it quite a bit as well. Uh, there are certain arguments and certain things and positions that we hold that we don't necessarily give a whole lot of thought to beyond the normal party responses and party lines. And we don't necessarily take the time to think about whether or not those party lines and party responses are really as good as they ought to be. Uh, for example, this is definitely a, a touchy area within Protestantism, uh, but one of the areas that can be like this, it isn't always, but definitely can be like this, is the issue of credo baptism versus pedo baptism. Do you baptize babies or not? That's, that's what's at, at play in that particular argument. And a lot of times, the arguments that are presented on either side, I'm not saying that uh, either side is somehow pristine in this or whatnot. Uh, but a lot of times the arguments that are presented on either side are very pat, um, definitely historical in a sense, and that they've been repeated for so long that people don't really give them a whole lot of thought anymore. They're just, 
this is what you say when this topic comes up, and this is how we know that the other guys are wrong because we've this is the way we've always argued this. Uh, the problem, though, is that a lot of those arguments that get used are not particularly good on either side. A lot of them are very tangential. Um, a lot of them are not very strong at all in a great many respects. Um, and, of course, I'm going to offend people on both sides by saying that, no, the evidence is perfectly and sufficiently clear, and da 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 da, -da. And I would admit that there are some lines of reasoning that can be very forceful and clear, but a lot of those, unfortunately, don't make their way into the more common popular arguments that are out there. Um, for a lot of Protestants as to why they would reject uh, pedo-baptism, child uh, baptism, basically, um, infant baptism, for a lot of them, the reason why they reject it is, well, that's what the Catholics do, and we're not Catholics, so we don't do that. Um, for others, it comes down to an argument of uh, basically Arminianism, synergism, free willism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but, you know, unless you've actually made a, a free will uh, commitment to Christ, whatever you're doing couldn't possibly, or is being done to you, couldn't possibly be valid. It has to be based on your will. Those are not particularly logical or valid or overly useful arguments. And then, like I said, the, the other side tends to do the uh, same things with uh, pedo baptism. You know, you have a comparison, for example, to the circumcision in the Old Testament that pedo baptists usually bring up. And that is something that, at the very least, needs to be thoroughly developed. That, and a lot of times, in the process of the argumentation, you don't actually see the thorough development that should be there. Um, sometimes you'll see very, very, very surface level uh, analyses of certain things that happen in the book of Acts that talk about households being baptized and those kinds of things. And, you know, it, it says household in the text, and therefore that would obviously include children and even young children, and therefore the argument is over because there's a, a passage or two that mentions households being baptized, and that's all we, that we need to look into. Not really good reasoning. Uh, very pat answers, not very thorough at all, and when it comes right down to it, sloppy. And that's the bigger issue at play here, not just with regard to credo baptism versus pedo baptism, or regarding the apocryphals or whatever uh, whatever else that happens to be at stake. The fact of the matter is that a lot of the things that Protestants believe, they believe on the basis of some very sloppy reasoning. I'm not saying that, that what they believe in all these areas is necessarily wrong, but what I'm saying is that the way that we argue for those positions do not honor God. Yes, that is exactly what I mean. I mean that you can have the right conclusion but come to it in a way that is incorrect, in a way that is incorrect in the sense that God would have reason to be disappointed in you for it. And that is how I feel that a lot of Protestants are with regard to a number of things that, that they would teach and believe and pass on to other people. Um, it is disappointing that this happens, of course, but it's the reality. And the only way that people are going to stop doing it is if we call people on the carpet when they're making a bad argument and tell them, you're not arguing in a thoroughly logical, reasonable, exegetically sound manner. You are dishonoring God with the kind of argument that you're making, and you need to stop. This is not to say that their conclusion is wrong. Okay, we're not saying that they should stop being Protestants. I'm not saying that they should stop being Protestants, because I am one. What I'm saying, though, and anyone who would be on my side, what I'm saying is that the way that you make an argument in many ways is just as important and in some regards even more important than the final conclusion that you reach. Hey, the ends do not justify the means. Now, with regard to the issue of the Apocrypha specifically, like I mentioned, there was someone in my church that had got given a presentation on the Apocrypha and the reasons that he gave, although very common, I've seen them in multiple places in Protestant circles, uh, not just within the, the particular Reformed community that I belong to, but in Pentecostal circles, general evangelical circles, um, even to a certain extent, actually, it's in a very minor way, but even to a certain extent, even in Mormon circles of all places, which are not Protestant in any meaningful 
uh, sense of the term. They are, they're not Christian in any, any meaningful sense of the term. Uh, they are definitely on the heretical side of things, unfortunately, and they are another group that needs to be reasoned with. They are another group that needs to be interacted with and talked to and called uh, to uh, truth. But, of course, that would be on a very different level from a Protestant who happens to have correct conclusions just comes to them incorrectly. With Mormonism, the problem is the reasoning is usually flawed and their conclusions are usually flawed. At least when I'm dealing with fellow Protestants that are using bad arguments, at least I don't have to worry about that part of it. Um, but uh, when it comes to this uh, particular fellow's presentation, it was pretty much everything with the common Protestant position on this matter that I detest. And hopefully in this information that I wind up presenting to all of you guys, uh, I'm going to write a, an article first, that much I have decided. And there might be follow-up on that article, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe I'll just sit there and, and read it for uh, the camera. I've done stuff like that before, and it is usually useful because when you do that, you get all of the information that the article can contain, and that part of it is very useful, but I admit it's a little boring to watch. Um, I've also thought about doing some something like a um, a PowerPoint kind of summation of everything that's in the article, and that could be useful. My only qualm about that is that while it's much more interesting to watch a PowerPoint than it is someone reading a manuscript, um, it is so condensed that sometimes a lot of very useful things get lost, especially compared to a full article. Uh, the article that I'm writing right now, uh, for example, is already over 7,000 words long. And kind of that's not hugely long, but that is a lot of material. Now, if I try to condense that down into PowerPoint form, um, there's no way I'm going to be fitting 7,000 plus words into a PowerPoint. It's just not going to happen. So there's a lot of material that could possibly get missed one way or another, and I don't want to do that uh, preferably. Uh, another thing that I've been toying around with is kind of breaking it up into to sections and maybe doing PowerPoints of those individual sections. Stuff is still going to get missed, but because it's smaller sections, I could be a little bit more thorough. I don't know, though, if anybody would actually be interested in what would effectively amount to a mini-series on uh, the Apocrypha and specifically bad reasons to reject the Apocrypha. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really do my video, uh, videos based on interest anyways, but, you know, that would definitely probably be in the low, low view count uh, side of things. And I do, though I don't necessarily make these videos, you know, to to get great crowds or anything like that, I do like them to be at least somewhat useful. And if you have to sit through, you know, 12 hours of material, I don't know how useful for the average person that's going to be. So I'm still kind of toying around with uh, different ways that I can present the material. Um, we'll see. Uh, if you guys have thoughts, comments, or suggestions on that, I would definitely be willing to listen. Uh, not necessarily, like I said, in terms of what's popular, but I do want it to be useful to you. Uh, so if you're someone who, you know, happens to be on the road a lot and you prefer to listen to things, let me know that that's the way that you uh, like to do things. If you're someone who prefers to see the PowerPoints and, you know, the little bullet points and everything, all, all, everything like that, kind of in a condensed form, tell me about that. If you're someone that, you know, thinks that having basically a read-through of the, the manuscript would be useful, or let's do that, or... Perhaps you think that the manuscript should be broken up into sections and you just want individual pieces and parts that, you know, you can get through a section and feel like you accomplish something and then come back to the rest later or something. Tell me about that. Uh, but like I said, term, tell me about it in terms of usefulness, not necessarily what you think is going to be the most popular, but I am curious to know what would be most useful for you, uh, those of you who are interested in this topic of, uh, you know, how do we come up with, well, that's not even a good way of phrasing it, but how do we argue in a biblical Christian way against the Apocrypha uh, that employs good logic, that honors God with the way that we reason. Uh, and as to this particular presentation and the main things that I'm going to be responding to, uh, there are basically seven poor reasons to reject the Apocrypha that I wanted to take a look at, and so I'll go ahead and tell you guys what those are. Uh, the first poor reason for rejecting the Apocrypha that came up I'm not necessarily doing these exactly in the order that he presented them, but just in kind of in my mind, the way that I would work through it. 
uh, the first one that I'm going to be dealing with, I'll say, is that uh, the there's a, the claim out there that the Apocrypha cannot be authentic to the Old Testament because they were not written in Hebrew. That's the first core reason to the eject the, uh, reject the Apocrypha. Um, that one, hopefully by the time that I'm done with all of the material, people will realize that that is actually a horrible argument. There's some of these arguments that are kind of in the classification of kind of sort of half-truths or something to it, usually not fleshed out very well, and you can kind of manage with that, but there's some of them that are just bad. And this is one of the ones that is just bad. People say, well, the Apocrypha can't be a part of the Old Testament because it wasn't written in Hebrew like the rest of the Old Testament was. Therefore, it's not a part of the Old Testament. <sighs> Rejecting or accepting scripture on the basis of what language it was written in is fraught with problems. And anyone who knows much about the Bible, especially the major language distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament, realizes just how big of a problem a language-based criteria of canonicity is going to be. So that is something that definitely needs to be addressed, and like I said, that is ultimately a very poor reason, and some of it should be fairly obvious, but I'm going to go into a lot more. Um, let's see here. That one I've already done basically the, the whole write-up on. Like I said, I'm not sure how I'm going to present it to you guys, but in terms of the article that I'm writing up, I've already written that section. Uh, and then I've also written the, the second uh, section here, and I think I'm on to the third one now, starting on the third one, somewhere in there. Uh, the second very poor reason to reject the Apocrypha that I wanted to address is the idea that they were derived from the Septuagint and not the Hebrew Bible, and because of that, they should be rejected. So this one is kind of related to the first one, but instead of focusing on the language, so much it's focused on the fact that this body of literature wasn't kept by the Hebrew people per se, kind of, sort of. Uh, but there's lots of myths out there about the uh, the Septuagint and how horrible it was, and uh, the fact that the you know the translators just added uh, a bunch of random things to it, so on and so forth. And most of these arguments are made by people who don't actually understand. Uh, the history of the Bible. I almost said biblical history. That's not what I mean. The history of the Bible, how we came to have the Bible, and how the different parts uh, were written, and how they came to be collected, and things like that. Uh, just lots and lots and lots of misconceptions that are out there regarding it. And one of the biz biggest misconceptions is the idea that the Septuagint is actually a thing, or at least originally was a thing, which it isn't. Uh, the Septuagint is something that we have come to use as a term uh, much more recently by comparison. Uh, the, uh, if you go far enough back in history, there was no... the idea that you would have this complete body of this complete corpus, if we want to say, this complete corpus of literature that is contained together and everybody knows exactly what this complete corpus of Old Testament type stuff is, simply didn't happen with regard to the Septuagint. Uh, even the idea that there was one group of 70 translators, because that's what Septuagint means, it means 70, the idea that there was one particular group of 70 translators who translated the whole thing and uh, cobbled it together and that kind of thing is also errant. Um, like I said, I'm going to explain this in a lot more detail in the actual article and hopefully in presenting it to you guys when I get to that point. But that is something that really definitely does need to die. Our, the concept of the Septuagint that we have is, at, is this idea of 70 translators translating basically everything that's associated with the Old Testament. And there, there's a lot of historical problems with that argument. It's, it's a claim that really cannot be substantiated from the history, but if you're dealing with people who don't know the history, then great, you know? Uh, that's, that's definitely an issue. All right, the third reason that I'm going to be addressing in this article, this third poor reason, I should say, for uh, rejecting the Apocrypha, is the claim that Jesus and the Apostles never quoted the Apocrypha, and therefore uh, they never treated it as, you know, canon, as scripture, so why should we? 
If they never did it, we shouldn't either. There are many problems with that logic as well, just to give you a, a one very small one. It's also true that Jesus and the apostles never quoted from some of the Old Testament books. Like, say, Ruth, for example. I'm not aware of any quotes that they have from them. I'm also pretty sure that they never at least directly quoted Obadiah. Does that mean that we should throw those out of the canon too? Because Jesus and the apostles never quoted them. Mm. That's an argument that you really need to be very, very, very careful about. Um, one of the big things that's going to be running throughout this article is the issue of consistency. That is, can you consistently apply the standard that you're applying over here to the Apocrypha to the rest of the canonical works that you want to accept and support? A lot of times, if you're going to be thorough and honest and truthful about it, the answer is no with regard to these poor reasons. I'm not saying that there aren't good reasons uh, to reject the Apocrypha as canon, uh, but these poor reasons are very oftentimes marked out by the fact that you cannot consistently apply them. Uh, the fourth poor reason for accepting the Apocrypha that I want to talk about is the claim that the early church uh, rejected the Apocrypha as canon. That one again is one that's um, oftentimes at the very least gets misrepresented. There is a certain kernel of truth to it, and we'll talk about that too. But there is also um, some grave misgivings about it as well. A lot of people do not understand what a lot of the arguments that were being made about the Apocrypha at the time were. Uh, one of the, for example, one of the, the big problems that you have is uh, Jerome's use of the term Apocrypha from which uh, Protestants uh, derive their usage of the term Apocrypha. His usage was actually abnormal in history. He and Cyril of Jerusalem are basically the only ones that ever used the term in that way to refer to that specific kind of literature. Uh, nobody else used the term that way. People did use the term, but they didn't use it like they did. Uh, they, those two are very unique in the way that they uh, use that terminology. And so if you're going to analyze what the early church was doing with the Apocrypha in a meaningful way, you need to understand how they use the different terms that were at play and how they view scripture as a whole, I'm not saying canonical scripture as a whole, but writings as a whole and Christian writings as a whole. And again, that's something that in a lot of Protestant presentations of the issue of the Apocrypha you don't get. Part of it is just time. Uh, in a lot of the presentations that are out there, you know, they're meant to be 45 minutes on why we don't accept the Apocrypha. And there's, it's just not enough time to have any kind of a thorough understanding of the history of what's going on there. Um, it's just way, 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 way too brief to, uh, to have anything meaningful to, to say about that. Uh, but the other issue is that a lot of times people are just lazy and regurgitate very brief um, summations that sometimes are not all that accurate, and they wind up uh, presenting them in ways that actually make them even less accurate than when they first received them. And that can certainly happen when it comes to how we portray uh, the early church and their relationship to the Apocrypha. Uh, there's always a tendency when any group looks at the early church to try to see themselves in the early church. Catholics look at the early church and they see Catholics. The Eastern Orthodox look at the early church and they see the Eastern Orthodox. Amazingly, uh, atheists and other people who uh, doubt the validity of Orthodox Christianity, and I'm using Orthodox in the little O sense, not Eastern Orthodox, but in the general historical sense of what Christians have, in a very general sense, understood, you know, being monotheists, having some kind of respect for the Bible, whatever that is, etc., etc. Um, even people who would doubt the legitimacy of the Bible look at the early church and they see reasons to doubt the re legitimacy of the Bible and Orthodox Christianity, etc. Everyone who looks at the early church wants to see themselves in that early church. The problem, of course, is that early Christians were not like any modern group. Their issues, their situation, their culture, um, what made them who they were, is distinct from us. And you cannot shoehorn them into believing exactly what we believe like we believe. They were not Catholics. They were not Eastern Orthodox. They certainly weren't atheists. And they weren't modern Protestants either. 
And when you look at those early church sources, you need to keep that in mind if you're going to deal with them fairly and appropriately. All right, and then the fifth core reason uh, to reject the Apocrypha that I'm going to address is the claim that the Apocrypha contains historical well, sorry, the claim that the Apocrypha contains historical errors and absurdities. This one is one that I think to a certain extent does have some legitimacy, but there are also some major, major, major potential pitfalls as well. Uh, and that's one of the biggest issues is, you know, who gets to decide what a historical error is? And can you apply that consistently? Because there's lots of people who would say that the Bible itself contains historical errors, and therefore it is false. Well, who gets to decide what the historical errors are and are not? If this, can you apply that consistently? As well as the claim that, well, the Apocrypha has stuff in it that's just absolutely absurd, therefore it couldn't possibly be true and it couldn't possibly be scripture. Well, the Hebrew canon as it is, within Protestant circles at least, and even within Judaistic circles, that the Hebrew canon, the Old Testament, uh, contains stories of the world being created out of nothing. To some people that would seem pretty absurd. It contains stories about axe heads floating. In case you're not aware, axe heads are not made of wood. They're not made of balloons or anything else that floats. So the idea that there could be an axe head that would float is a pretty strange thing. There are lots of things uh, that the Hebrew canon uh, without the Apocrypha contains that can seem pretty absurd, at least to certain observers. And then that whole issue of consistency comes into uh, play again. I, like I said, I understand why it's so compelling for a lot of people, but if you are someone who was brought up with these accounts, just like you've been brought up with, you know, the accounts of Elijah being taken up in a whirlwind of fire, if you're taken up with these, uh, if you're brought up with these stories, they're not going to seem absurd to you. So who gets to decide what absurd is, and who gets to decide what historical error is or is not? Is it maybe just the case that we don't understand enough about the history at that time to really make an accurate determination as to what is historically accurate and is not? That is something that needs to be dealt with. Uh, the issue of consistency, like I said, plagues this whole discussion. Uh, uh, the sixth poor reason to address the Apocrypha that I'm going to cover in the, in the article slash mini book, whatever you want to call it, and hopefully present to you guys in some useful format. Uh, but the sixth poor reason to eject, reject the Apocrypha is the claim that the Apocrypha contains teachings that contradict the canonical works. Well, in this day and age, with all the progressives and liberals that we dealt with, and to a certain extent they're nothing new, there have always been uh, theological liberals of one sort or another in, in history. It's just a matter of how far, how far they go. Uh, but when you talk about contradictions in what is taught in a theological system, uh, one of the biggest problems that we run into is that historically in Protestantism we have favored systematic theology, which is the idea that once you have determined what the body of authoritative revelation is, your job is then to systematize that body, to figure out how the different parts interact with each other so that the whole thing holds true, that you don't force a contradiction between the parts. And so if you're going to argue that there are contradictions in the ecclesiasticals with the rest of canonical scripture, that argument basically assumes from the outset that the, uh, that the ecclesiasticals, that the apocrypha, I, I call them ecclesiasticals in the, art, in the article, uh, that I'm writing because it's a little hist a bit more uh, accurate historically speaking. Uh, but if you're going to argue that the Apocryphas contradict the rest of the canon, you're basically already assuming that the canon can't include the Apocryphas in order to say that we don't have to systematize those parts. Uh, but we do systematize parts that are at least um, on the surface, I'm not saying that they legitimately are, but at least on the surface, seem to contradict other parts of the canon. One of the, the greatest examples that shows up in a lot of the, the more liberal literature that is out there is the, 
fact that Paul and James say things that at least on the surface seem contradictory. Paul says that we are saved by faith apart from works. James says, uh, sorry, Paul says that we're saved by faith apart from works. And James, on the other hand, says that faith without deeds is dead. Now, a uh, student of the word, and I'm not saying a terribly great student, but a student of the word should be able to identify some of the problems with that kind of a juxtaposition pretty quickly. Uh, namely, that those are spoken into two different contexts, and that plays a huge part into how something should be taken and how those two things would be dealt with. Uh, but on the surface, taken just as they are apart from the context, they do seem to conflict with one another. We are saved by faith apart from works. Faith without deeds is dead. Seems kind of contradictory just by itself without the broader context of what was actually being said as a whole uh, by each of those respective authors. Uh, one of the things that we have to consider when it comes to those kinds of claims in the Apocrypha is whether or not some of the same kinds of things might be going on. Yes, the apocryphal books say certain things that would seem to contradict uh, what uh, scripture, uh, scripture teaches elsewhere, but one of the things that you can rightly ask is, is it actually teaching that? Uh, for example, some of the things happen in accounts and narratives uh, that are simply relating what happened, what did people do? It's not necessarily saying that this is how you ought to act or how, what you should do. Uh, if that's the case, if all that is being related is simply what happened, not necessarily that it should have happened, well then it's not contradicting anything else in canonical scripture at all. If it's not didactic, if it's not meant to actually teach uh, something uh, directly, if it's not saying you should do this, but rather saying this is what this person did and this is what the outcome uh, was, and you need to learn from the example, both the good and the bad, if it's providing an example rather than a didactic teaching of saying this is exactly what is right and this is exactly what is wrong, if it's in a different category, so to speak, well then there isn't the tension there. Those kinds of things need to be looked at. We need to look at it from the perspective of if this was something that we did in, uh, include in the canon, would we be arguing about this the same way? Or is this something that could actually be harmonized with a Protestant understanding of things? And more specifically, with a more general canonical approach to things. Uh, that is, are these things necessarily in conflict, or are we just saying they are because it makes for an easier argument against the apocryphals, uh, apocryphals the apocryphal books? And then last, but certainly not least, uh, the last poor reason that I wish to address, uh, the poor reason to reject the apocryphals that I wish to address is the claim that they deny their own canonicity. Uh, this one largely has a, a lot of truth to it and a lot of support for it, uh, but it's certainly not true of all of the books. And how you deal with the books that don't and that kind of thing, and even the books that do, sometimes when we get to the books that do, we are not very careful in the way that we uh, make that argument and use some one arguments that are just frankly not solid and don't actually apply to the book that we think they do. A classic example is 2 Maccabees. 2 Maccabees ends more or less with the author saying, you know, I tried to do a good job, and if I didn't, I'm sorry, but if I did, fantastic. You know, it's a very humble ending of the book. And a lot of Protestant authors have decried the ending of 2 Maccabees, saying, well, if this was really scripture, he should, you know, have the, the thus saith the Lord statement at the end. Um, really? Is that necessary? I mean, where in the Bible does it say that the, the author of a work has to be, um, cannot say, you know, my tongue is feeble, uh, my hands don't serve me well when I write, etc., etc. I do not turn good phrases. I mean, that's essentially what uh, Moses did. He said, you know, I'm, I'm slow of speech. And so God gave him Aaron as a speak for him. Um, a lot of Protestants realize that there's a little bit of an issue there. That, you know, there were people in the Bible that were very much so humble and didn't think highly of themselves. And it comes across in the sources that we do have that that was not their perspective. That doesn't mean that they didn't think that what they had put forward 
um, had no authority whatsoever or that it shouldn't be read, but what they're saying is that, you know, I'm not a stylistic genius and I don't claim to be. That doesn't mean that the work has no value in that person's eyes. And it wouldn't necessarily in and of itself have a bearing on whether or not it's canonical. Um, that's, that's not a particularly good reason in that kind of scenario. Uh, but again, there's, there's more subtlety that is needed there and that needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. So anyways, that's the, uh, the, the project that I'm working on right now. Like I said, I'm already over 7,000 words into the article. So it's going to be a long one, and I've only uh, got through part of the first two reasons as to why they're problematic. I haven't done at all uh, poor reasons three through seven. And then I certainly have not gotten anywhere close to presenting a positive argument. That is, okay, these are bad reasons to reject the Apocrypha, so why do we eject the Apocrypha? What are the good reasons? I want to put that in there as well, because if you don't put that in there, then uh, that that can result in other problems as, as well as far as what people uh, would think about the status of the canon and the status of the Bible as a whole. Uh, so that's what I'm uh, doing right now. That's what I'm working on. Um, hopefully you guys will find it useful when it finally gets done. And like I said, I would really appreciate it if down in the comments you guys would tell me what your preferences for presentation would be. Are you okay with me just reading a manuscript? Would you prefer that I break it up into sections? Would you prefer that I do a PowerPoint? Would you prefer that I, maybe I do a series of PowerPoints? Um, what, what's your druthers? And like I said, I, I'm looking at this from the uh, perspective of utility. What is most useful to you guys? Um, not necessarily what's popular. My channel's never been particularly popular. Uh, that's just kind of a given. But I very much so do want to know what would be useful to you guys and what wouldn't be. So, with that being said, thank you all for your time and attention. For those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. And for those of you who are not, I pray that you come to know the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.